themselves. I'd like to first say that you're not going to see glitz here, so please don't expect it. I'm not an entertainer nor an actor. I've created this video as a tool designed to educate people about a business concept that works for people who are willing to put 100% of themselves into something. See, it takes 200% to be successful in business. 100% must come from you. 100% must come from the business vehicle that you've chosen. Business vehicle meaning how you earn your living, how you support your family. I've seen people who relentlessly pour 100% of themselves into a business vehicle, profession, or job, but that vehicle doesn't have the capability to give back 100%. The mechanics of wealth are just not there. But no one has ever fully explained to you why it doesn't work and why it's a waste of your valuable time if your goal is financial success. This video is for the person who is willing to put in their 100%. They're only lacking the right business vehicle, the explanation of why it's right, and the evidence that it does in fact work. Even though I say you must put in 100%, that doesn't mean that you have to work it full time. I didn't. That doesn't mean you have to sacrifice your family time, nor does it mean you have to have prior experience. I didn't. What you'll learn right here has allowed me to build a $25 million company. Now, a $25 million company has certainly been done before. However, this was done where no employees were required. No accounts receivable, no accounts payable, no overhead, and very little inventory. Recently, I said those words to a business owner who said back to me, sounds too good to be true. My response back to him was, is that a good enough reason to stop looking? He paused for a couple of seconds and he said, that wouldn't be very smart, would it? What I suggest you do is not just watch this information, but study it. What I want to do first is create an equal playing field between people who know how to evaluate a business and those who don't. Because me explaining this business wouldn't be very effective until you understand how to place value to a business. The simplest thing for someone to do when they don't understand something is to go, ah, it doesn't work. The way I'll accomplish this equal playing field is to give you four main principles to look for in a business. Number one is a huge expanding market. If you were the best vinyl record producer in the world, would it matter today? No. It doesn't matter how good you are in an industry that's eroding. Number two is a unique and consumable product. I'll cover unique first. If you don't have a unique product, then you compete on price and convenience. Who has the best price? Who's closest to the customer? Yet if you have uniqueness, then people must come to you. Next is consumable. If you have a non-consumable product, you're basically unemployed until your next sell. You want the repeat sales of consumable products. Whether it's every time someone picks up the telephone, connects to the internet, renews a membership, turns on electricity, or gets to the bottom of a box or a bottle, you want those repeating commissions because it can pay you again and again. Number three is timing. Primarily here I'm talking about trends and timing. During all cycles of the economy, there are people who are making money and losing money. The makers are the ones in front of large trends. The losers disregard trends. How do you get in front of large trends? You study what creates them. Without any hesitation, in today's society, it's the baby boom generation that creates the largest trends. The baby boomers are a group of babies born between 1946 and 1964. There were 76 million of them born in the United States, a billion of them worldwide. Why is this group so talked about? They're one-third of the U.S. population and control 65% of all the money. I've likened the magnitude of all those babies to a basketball moving through a garden hose. They reshape every industry they go through. See, if you can predict where this basketball is going down the garden hose, you possess the ability to make fortunes. I want to give you some historical examples of the obvious buying patterns of these boomers. It started with a company called Gerber back in 1940, who were barely known. But by 1955, just 10 years after the boomers were born, they had sold 1.8 billion jars of strained baby food. As the boomers took their first steps, it was Buster Brown and Kenny Shoes. When the boomers went out to play, Mattel and Hasbro got rich, providing toys to this young group. In 1957, we built more elementary schools in the U.S. in one year just to handle the overflow than we did in any 12-year period before or after. As the boomers went through their teens, Dairy Queen, McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken became billion-dollar companies feeding the boomers. When the boomers moved through their 20s and 30s, which was in the mid-70s, what was the industry to be in? Real estate. Why? Because the boomers had heard from their parents one time too many, as long as you're living under my roof, you'll do as I say. So they wanted their own roof. 
which created a 15-year real estate boom. And people are still talking today about the great time frame to be in real estate. Then what happened to the real estate market in the late 80s? It began its decline. Why? The basketball had moved through the real estate industry. Another example of this is the U.S. stock market. Several years ago, I heard a stock market analyst speaking on the radio saying that he just couldn't believe the stock market had a 15-year rise. Notice the number 15 years keeps coming up. Anyone with a good understanding of the baby boomers could have seen this coming and profited from the recent stock market activity. Why does this 15-year number keep coming up? Because the baby boomers were born between 1946 and 1964. And so 18 years separates the front edge from the back edge. A very important number for you. If you look for trends on the front side of the basketball, you get the full 18 years for your products to be popular. That's the reason you study the nose of the basketball. So your business, no matter what your business is, is to be looking at what industries are expanding or which industries are about to expand. You shouldn't care how long you've been doing something or how long you've been in school to learn something. Are you in front of trends or not? Don't have a loyalty to something just because you've been educated in it or doing it for a long time. So looking at the current trends, we basically got a billion people who are in their 50s and 60s. Since that's the case, what business do you want to be in? Let's look at some obvious current and future trends. Health and looking younger are going to be tremendous trends. The boomers do not like what aging is doing to them. So products that fend off aging as well as vanity issues will continue to boom. Businesses that focus on retirement issues will do very well. The crux of it will start with the boomers having enough money to retire. Businesses that offer ways to make money will obviously flourish. Legal matters such as wills and estate planning will become large trends. Efficiencies will also grow. The television was too far away from the couch for the boomers, so they invented the remote control device. Today, they have their entire library of books and music in their cell phones. The boomers have always been enamored with technologies that make life easier. These technologies will actually create industries. For example, the computer created the need for antivirus software. The Internet has created a need for identity theft protection and firewalls. But there will be many additional industries created by the computer and Internet technologies. It is the computer plus the Internet that made the iPod, iPad, and iPhone possible. As a side note, the baby boomers are not the only trendsetters. They are just the largest and have most of the money. As the world becomes one, the international market will play a big role as well as the group born just after the baby boomers that are known as Generation X. But remember... The boomers control 65% of all the money. So when a bright Generation X person creates a great new product or service, they must make it simple enough that a baby boomer can understand it. Otherwise, that product will not reach mass acceptance. Those are some of the big trends. So if you want to be brilliantly compensated, you must focus on industries and companies that have positioned themselves in front of these trends. All right, let's move forward. Number four is leverage. I'm going to spend some time on this one because we're not really taught this in our society. We're taught to go get a good education, build a resume, and exchange our expertise for someone's dollars. The problem with that is if we're not exchanging our expertise, we're not making any dollars. So vacation time is costly. A walk around the golf course, costly. Family time, although extremely important, is costly. I'll define the word leverage as an increased means by which to attain something. One form of leverage is investing $5 million and earning 10% interest, which will yield you about 41 grand a month in income. So whether you're enjoying family time or playing golf or vacationing, you're still enjoying 41 grand a month in income. You're leveraging off your money. That's a leverage everyone would love, but very few have it. Let me explain another kind of leverage that's available to everyone, including yourself. Incidentally, if you get nothing more out of this video than a better understanding of this little simple concept, I'm going to explain you'll have gained something very valuable for watching it. Imagine, if you will, you own a company. You employ just one person, me. I work for eight hours on Monday. You work for the same eight hours on Monday that I do. Now listen closely. You get paid on 16 hours worth of work. Because you take a portion of my productivity as income back to yourself. 
you're leveraging off my efforts because I'm your employee. So theoretically, the more employees you have working for you, the more leverage you have. However, have you ever had employees? If you have, you know that in theory, hiring employees sounds great, but it's very difficult to reach leverage through employees. I've heard it said that if you have one employee, you have one headache. If you have 100 employees, you run an adult daycare center. And the reason being is this, no employee will ever work as hard for your company as you will because they don't own it. Here's my rule of thumb for reaching true leverage. If there's one sentence that epitomizes the entire video, it would be this. To have true leverage, you must create a situation where everyone has the same amount to gain. Only then do you have true leverage. Let me give you an example of this type of leverage. Let's say that I'm a real estate broker and I hire an agent named Robert. Robert goes out and sells a building. Robert earns a percentage of the selling price of the building, and so do I, the broker. Why do I, the broker, earn a percentage when it was Robert who sold the building? Well, I did some of the advertising. I trained Robert. I had the initiative to go get my broker's license in the first place. I put up the risk. I did a lot of things. And so it's valid that I, as the broker, earn my money. But Robert doesn't work for me as an employee. He's an independent contractor. He just hangs his real estate license on my wall. My point here is the broker and the agent have the same amount to gain from the sale of the home. It is totally in the agent's interest to earn more money, which is a form of leverage for the broker. There is a flaw in this leverage situation that I've shown you, and it's this. The broker can have multiple agents, but the agents cannot. The broker has leverage. The agents don't. Until the agents do what most brokers dread, what happens when I, the broker, have been real effective at teaching Robert to be a good agent? What's Robert going to want to do in a couple of years? Be his own broker, right? Is this good for me, the broker? No, because as soon as he becomes a broker, two bad things happen to me. Number one, he breaks away from me and I lose him as an income source. And two, worse than that, he's now my competitor that I trained. He knows all my good stuff. By the way, this doesn't just happen in the real estate industry. It happens in practically every industry. Have you ever heard the expression, I'm just going to work there for experience? What does that mean? It means I'm going to strip them of their knowledge and then go do it myself. If you're a business owner, how many people have you trained who are no longer working for you? How many people have you trained to be your competitors? Well, this gets worse. Let's say that Robert is now a broker right down the street. What will he do now that he's a broker? He'll go out and hire his own agents. And let's say one of those agents is Linda. Linda also eventually wants to be a broker. So she becomes a competitor to me that I indirectly trained, as well as Robert, who I directly trained. And this continues on and on. I actually created a chain of competitors that I trained. What if we did a whole paradigm shift? Here's where this becomes brilliant. Let's say instead I'm going to empower Robert to become a broker. I want him to become a broker from day one. See, the only way that you or I can retain a leader is provide him or her with the same opportunity for growth that we have. Hence, an opportunity where everyone has the same amount to gain. So from day one, I'm going to encourage Robert to be a broker. And when he does, he doesn't break away from me and become my competitor. He shifts from agent to broker, which now allows him to sponsor his own agents. Now, to create an incentive for me, the broker, to always help Robert and his agents, I'm still going to earn a percentage of what he and his agents sell. And shouldn't I? I trained him. I put up the risk and all those reasons I mentioned earlier. Now, the percentage I earn from Robert and his organization should be a lot smaller than when he was an agent, but I should still earn a percentage. That's my incentive to keep working with them. Now, some people look at this and say, gosh, isn't that one of those pyramids? And what's the perception of a pyramid? People at the top making all the money and the people down below do all the work, right? Isn't that the perception of a pyramid? Let me explain why this is not a pyramid and why people at the top don't necessarily make all the money. Let me just make a quick point before I discuss the pyramid issue. It's not the geometric shape that people have a problem with. 
This geometric shape is probably the shape of your family tree, the shape of our government. To the architect, it's the strongest structure known to man. Every organizational structure in the world is this shape. So the shape isn't the problem. However, that perception, people at the top earn all the money. Let me illustrate that for you. Here's a typical corporation. At the top, you have a CEO, which stands for Chief Executive Officer. Does the president earn more money than the CEO? Not normally. How about below the president? Do any of the vice presidents earn more money than the president? No. Let me ask this question, and I want you to really think about it. What would happen if some of the vice presidents of a corporation made more money than the president? Really, what would happen? Talk about total confusion. This whole process is called delegation. Each level of the corporation earns less income. The reason the president can tell the vice president what to do is because they make more money. So the corporate structure is people at the top making the majority of the money and the people at the bottom do not. The CEO of any corporation earns off the productivity of or is leveraged off of everyone in his or her corporation. Whether that CEO personally hired every employee or someone else in the company hires them. So the CEO and only the CEO earns on multiple levels of his or her company. And the model that I'm suggesting as being brilliant is where you, the individual, are given that same opportunity to earn on multiple levels of brokers and agents, just as the CEO of a corporation is. From here on, I'll refer to this form of marketing as network marketing. In network marketing, you, the individual, are given the opportunity to earn off the productivity of the people in your organization, whether you personally sponsor them or someone in your organization sponsors them. Remember that I said to reach true leverage, you must create a situation where everyone has the same amount to gain. Well, that's what I just described. Here's what makes the network marketing structure the absolute fairest structure available. In most network marketing companies, everyone can earn a certain number of levels deep of the organization they build. Everyone in the company can earn that same number of levels deep, like maybe four levels deep or six levels deep. Let's say we use four levels. So if you build an organization to be more productive, then you would earn more money than I would, even if you were in my organization. In the example shown, you would earn on three levels I couldn't reach because everyone gets the same number of levels. There are people in my organization right now that earn more money than I do. Do you know what I call that? Fair. Shouldn't it be that way? I mean, take any structure. Shouldn't the most productive person in that structure make the most money? Now I'd like to show you an interview that I did a few years ago with Dr. Charles King, who holds a PhD from Harvard and is a professor of marketing at the University of Illinois at Chicago, who actually teaches network marketing at the university. Dr. King, we're delighted to have you here. I'm pleased to be here, Tim. Dr. King, could you tell us a little of your education and your business background? Tim, I'm a professor of marketing at the University of Illinois at Chicago. I got my bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Texas in Austin, spent a tour of duty with the Exxon Corporation, and then returned to get my doctorate in business administration from Harvard University. More important to this discussion, over the last six years, I've been involved in doing research, teaching, and consulting in network marketing. So coming from such a conservative school, and I know you a little bit, and I know you to be very conservative, what caused you to look at network marketing to begin with? In 1990, we had a major economic recession in the United States. The Midwest and Chicago particularly were very badly hit. As a result, the interviewers stopped coming to campus. We were graduating hundreds of students a semester and they weren't getting jobs. Our alumni were coming back to us losing their jobs looking for help and we had nothing to offer them. Now I started looking because of my background in, in business consulting at alternative career paths. I went out and I looked at starting your own business, at home-based businesses. I looked at franchising. I looked at direct selling. And in the direct selling arena, I backed into network marketing. Now, I was very cynical, skeptical. Tell them I was negative about network marketing. They don't teach network marketing at the Harvard Business School. And I didn't know much about it. The end result was uh, one of my students who was on the team asked me, why are you so negative about network marketing? I looked at that young man and I said, son, I know enough to know I don't want to know anymore. 
that student looked at me and he said, Professor, if I gave you that answer to that question with no more information than you have, you would give me an F. I turned to him and I said, Son, you're absolutely right. I have no basis for that conclusion. You just made an A. As a result, we went to the library, we went to meetings, and for the next six months, we did due diligence on the network marketing industry. I visited the top companies, I talked to network marketing leaders, I became an evangelist. In 1990-91, we started teaching network marketing in the marketing curriculum at the university. Suppose you run across the super skeptic. What advice do you have for them? Tim, I would recommend they do precisely what I did. I was a super skeptic. I did my due diligence, I investigated the industry, and I drew my own conclusions. I strongly recommend that you do your due diligence and then begin to define precisely what role you want to play in the network marketing industry. Set realistic expectations. If there is a single cause for failure in this industry, it's the get-rich-quick syndrome. Thinking that you can come into the industry and make enormous sums of money with no work. I argue, by contrast, that if you set realistic expectations, you develop a plan of action to guide your business development, you can be successful. And that's coming from a Harvard Business School graduate who was a true skeptic, but through due diligence, he learned the truth. Warren Buffett owns a network marketing company. If you don't know who he is, he's typically listed in the top five richest people in the world. He created his wealth by investing in and buying the highest quality companies. Why do you think Microsoft or AT&T, Gillette, Colgate, Citibank, IBM, Toyota, Xerox, Texas Instruments, General Motors, General Electric, AOL, Oracle, Sun Microsystems, Coca-Cola, and many others distribute some or all of their products and services through network marketing? They use this method to distribute products because network marketing is a very efficient model to distribute products and services. These large corporations are firm testimony to the industry's success and credibility. This confirms what Professor King was saying about that the industry has come of age and is now a true profession. The reason so many people are coming into network marketing is because people want control of their life. They want a quality of life, and network marketing truly offers that. I hear people all the time complaining that they are too busy or don't have enough time. People act as though time owns them instead of them owning time. Have you ever noticed that there are people who, with 24 hours, earn $10,000 a year? And there are people in the same 24 hours who earn $10 million a year? Let me explain the difference. I've heard people say this phrase, it's easier to just do it myself than try to get other people to do it. Whenever I hear that phrase, I know that person just nailed their feet to the floor. All they can do is expend their time, not invest their time. Here's a secret. Wealth is hidden from those who must do it all themselves. Wealth exposes itself to those patient enough to train others. When you understand the power of educating and empowering others so that you get more done, you're truly on your way to wealth. Now, with that understanding of the importance of training others so you get more done, look at network marketing and you'll see why I call it brilliant compensation. In network marketing, what you teach and train others to do is duplicate what you do, which is to find and train others. This is actually multiplying you. That's why I say next to your spiritual growth and your family, there is nothing in the world you can do that will reward you better than investing your time in network marketing. I'd like to cover one last thing in closing, which I feel is one of the most important points for you to fully understand the value of network marketing. Let me illustrate something to you that is so profound. What's the maximum number of hours you could work in a day? 24 hours, right? So if you didn't sleep all day, you could work 24 straight hours. What if you didn't sleep for a whole year? You could actually work 8,760 hours in one year but that's the maximum number of hours you could work in a year. I have 56,000 people in my organization worldwide. Well, let's suppose that all 56,000 people work just one hour out of a year. 56,000 people times one hour each equals 56,000 hours of work that I'm being paid on. Well, for most people to earn on 56,000 hours of work, they'd have to work for over six 
years, 24 hours a day without sleep to put in the same amount of hours that I could in one hour a year. Let me throw in something really ridiculous. Suppose all my 56,000 people worked one eight-hour day in a year. 56,000 people times eight hours is 448,000 hours I'm being paid on. Well, it would take most people working over 51 years, 24 hours a day, to do what I could do in eight hours a year. Eight hours in one year versus 51 years working 24 hours a day? Doesn't seem fair, does it? It's definitely not fair. What's not fair is that you haven't understood this until today, and other people have. But now that you understand it, take responsibility for it. Don't go running and try to create reasons why you can't do this. You can do this. I don't say any of this to impress you. I don't need to impress you. This is an educational-only video. My purpose in creating this tool is to contribute back to that woodpile that so generously gave to me. Because network marketing has given me a lifestyle I previously couldn't have imagined. And because network marketing has given me total financial and time freedom, I feel it my responsibility to explain the industry in an understandable way. So I say all of this only to impress upon you that the difference between the wealthy and everyone else is leverage. You've got to understand that. And nothing gives you, the individual, leverage in such an ethical way like network marketing can. So go get a pad of paper, write down what you really want in life. Then call the person who gave you this video and tell them whether you're an A, B, or C. C is see you later. No thanks. That's fine with us because your relationship with the person who gave you this video is more important to us than anything. Or you're a B. A B is I may be. I want to first explore the product. If that's you, then do that. Don't procrastinate. The number one killer of financial success is procrastination. People just putting it off until tomorrow, and they've somehow convinced themselves that they'll actually do it tomorrow. You know what I'm talking about. As soon as I'm done with this project, then I'll have more time. Or as soon as little Jimmy gets back to school, then I can, and they never do. If a person has an excuse, they have all they need to fail. Don't let that be you. Get your product today. Or you're an A. And that means absolutely. No, you don't have all your questions answered, but you see enough to start and begin your training. Very well done to you in your ability to make decision. If it's late at night and you just watch this, don't be concerned that the person who gave this to you is sleeping right now. They'll be up. And if they're not, wake them up. Tell them, hey, now that I understand this thing, I can't sleep. And if I can't sleep, you're not going to sleep. Believe me, they'll appreciate that call. So call that person and tell them whether you're an A, B, or C. That's it. Join us. You'll be glad you did. Now is the right time, the smart time. Thank you for taking the time to view this video. I hope it's been educational to you. What I really hope is that you'll put this information to good use. Next, you'll see some common questions that you can interact with. I look forward to working with you, should our paths cross. I'm Tim Sales.